So, we're, we're almost finished. Um, the last speaker of uh, the day in the symposium, uh, except I think there's a few small details at the end, um, is Jerry Smith. Um, Jerry is a, a colleague of mine here at Scripps, for those of you who don't know that. Um, we, have adjacent, we have adjacent offices. Uh, and unfortunately, we share the same air conditioning system, <laughs> which uh, actually he and uh, Rob Pinkle and I share the same air conditioning system. Um, and given the fact that the three of us have different metabolisms, um, and uh, uh, one, uh, one temperature control between us, and some master of the main campus there who controls the range of temperatures that we can share, uh, we have had a continued battle with our air conditioning system for <laughs> ages. Um, that's the downside. The, the good side of being next door to Jerry is that Jerry is an absolute wealth of information. Um, and he has a very great knowledge of air sea interaction processes. And if you are stuck understanding something in this area, Jerry is often a good resource to go and talk to. Because if he doesn't have the answer himself, which he usually does, um, he will probably know where to look for it. So uh, I, I consider it a great advantage to be, to be next door. Um, Jerry is, I think, you know, one of Jerry's most important pieces of work uh, were his observations in the early 90s of the growth of language circulations off the coast here, uh, which are still, those observations are still used as the standard by which models are tested. And um, so that's, a, yeah, that's an enduring contribution to this, this area of air scene direction. So, um, Jerry, it's yours. Okay. Well, first I'd like to thank the organizers and, and acknowledge them for the uh, graphic that I shamelessly stole from <laughs> <laughs> my title slide. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, I feel just a little bit out of place here since I never was a, a student of Ken's. I was, never even sat in on any of his classes. Um, but we, we do share an air conditioning system that we can complain about. Which side has the higher? So um, we, we've seen already a, has enormous influence over a very broad range of stuff. And I'm not really going to go into, uh, into this myself. Um, the, wave breaking, land to sea. Uh, one thing I've left off of here is uh, a collaboration that we did do where we went to the equator in, in 2012. And uh, <coughs> our group fielded a whole bunch of different instruments and his group fielded a whole bunch of instruments and also instruments on behalf of other people who weren't there. We could probably have a whole symposium um, just with the people, you know, a talk for each instrument. So, I thought I would turn to uh, to current and future efforts because we're working together now on uh, trying to get more good data about Langer circulation. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea to look toward the future because, as they often say on Monty Python, He's not dead yet. <laughs> um, so this is the tentative site for uh, for the flip trip next March. It's going to be three or four weeks long, and we're going to have, uh, as usual, if you invite Ken, you you get a whole lot of other stuff too. And we'll also have uh, Eric Terrell and Eric Desaro um, driving around in boats and. There'll be wave gliders and AUVs in the water, and I think an airplane um, flying from the coast. So there's going to be a lot of data one way or the other. 
And uh, uh, this has inspired me to, to, to go back and look again at uh, the whole issue of the development of the mixed layer of the ocean. And I thought I would just start with a slight review of kind of where we are. Uh, we mostly find that the initial deepening, when you turn on the wind, the uh, surface layer accelerates until it, it exceeds kind of a bulk Richardson number, and then it starts digging into the thermocline below. And uh, this accounts for most of the deepening. But then, after that, if the wind keeps blowing, I think uh, Lee and Garrett pretty convincingly showed that um, the, the continued deepening that can happen is uh, scales with the uh, Langmuir circulation light scales. And so it's thought, just skipping to the bottom, that um, <coughs> Langmuir circulations are important to this continued deepening. And since that's a cumulative thing, that's important to getting the mixed layer right over, over a seasonal scale and therefore getting the climate. Um, so in terms of Langmuir circulation, or Langer turbulence. Um, we kind of have this score sheet, which um, I'm a little embarrassed to say is copied directly from a, a talk I gave in 1998. <laughs> uh, so we, we've made a lot of progress. <laughs> so the, we have uh, you know buoyancy forces and inertial motion and surface stirring uh, by the waves and by wave breaking and. Uh, Hopefully, as output, we get the right depth of the mixed layer, layer uh, which also provides a length scale for the turbulence. And we get the temperature and density near the surface correctly so that we can do um, you know, climate models properly. And one of the remaining scales that we'd like to understand is just how, how strong was the velocity scale of these overturning circulations. And that's important to a, a lot of things like the uh, the net fluxes of materials through the, the mixed layer. And it's also important to plankton that get infected up and down, out, in and out of the light. And so it depends on that time scale has, has a great effect on how well the, the plankton can grow. So that was the, that's the motivation for looking at this uh, VRMS or the or BLC. I should say also um, that from um, analysis of models um, and a, a regime diagram was devised by uh, Ming Lee, Chris Garrett, and Eric Skillingstad. Um, and what they, what they show is that for Langer turbulence, the crosswind components are the largest, the, the V and W, and the uh, along wind variations are smaller. Whereas for shear driven uh, turbulence, the a long shear is the biggest, and the other two are smaller. And in convection, the vertical is the biggest, and the other two are smaller. So if you can just get a handle on those three components, you can, you can decide what regime you're in, if you don't know already. So I'm actually going to talk about one of those uh, data from one of those. Uh, this is actually 1995 data, but it was published in 98. And um, what we've got here is this flips track um, in the second half of this um, marine boundary layer experiment. Uh, we went up off Point Conception because we were assured we would have strong winds and you know, lots of mixing occurring. And uh, this was a, a four-week cruise. And the, in the first two weeks, um, Rob Pinkle was, was the lead, and we were looking for internal waves generated off the continental slopes. And <coughs> for the whole two weeks, it was just, just about as calm as it is today, off point of conception. Then uh, we changed groups. Well, uh, some of us came out on a boat from Morrow Bay and got on flip, and the corresponding number of people got on the boat and went back to Morrow Bay. And, uh, so now the focus was going to be on Langmuir circulation, and nature cooperated and gave us a storm. <laughs> um, but, but just before the storm, what happened was we, we got stuck in a current here of uh, over a meter per second that was pushing on flip in this direction. And the whole experiment was originally supposed to be moored. So we had, it was a single point mooring, so we just had one mooring line to hold the station. 
because this is really pretty close to the coast for, for a free drift. But this uh, current turned flip around. Well, flip, flip is still facing, um, let, me, let me describe this more clearly. There's still a, a weak wind from the northwest. And so the top part of flip naturally wind veins away from the wind. So the top part of flip is facing southeast. And the current is pushing flip to the northeast. This means the mooring line, which is attached to the top, was swinging around and was threatening to clean off the booms and you know, dispense with all of our sonic anemometers. And so uh, I had to convince Tom Golfinos, who is the captain and, and will be the captain in, the, in March as well, um, to, to cut the mooring line. And of course, the big worry was that this might just be an eddy, in which case we would be <coughs> running into shore and have to abandon flip. <laughs> but that didn't happen. We kept going, we kept motoring along at about a meter per second. And then the wind shifted around and started coming up from the southeast. just wanted to, to show, I guess I should show, this is the basic layout of equipment we had to be able to sector scan this, that gives us a, a view of the surface, of the currents and so forth. We had some other um, sonars to give us a, a more complete directional wave spectrum. And we had a rapidly profiling CTD so that we could watch the evolution of the mixed layer. And we also had, um, not shown on here, we had some, uh, four wave wires in a one meter box so that we could do um, a more of a standard kind of directional wave estimate to compare with these sonar based ones. So the uh, nature cooperated and gave us this, this wind event um, where the wind ramps up <coughs> pretty steadily over <coughs> um, um, a little over a day, 30, 37 hours. And it came from the southeast. So this is blowing straight, opposing to the uh, background northwest swell. So the wind is coming up, blowing against the waves. And uh, what we have here is the, the wind. And this is actually the, the surface stokes drift of the waves, which I'll probably explain, I'll explain a little better uh, later. So you can see it takes a while for the waves to respond to the change in the wind direction. It's a little bit of a lag. Then they, they do come around eventually. Now just to, uh, just to put some perspective on it as we get out here to the 15 meters per second with gusts up to 22 or so, um, this is more or less what the view was um, off of flip. And we're now, we're now free drifting so we're we're quite comfortably in the lee of the of the hull, and you can stand out there and watch watch the ocean thrashing. So the just to sort of skip to the punchline here. Ooh, why is that crossed out? Um, can anyone see the little circles? You look very carefully. I don't know why it faded so much. Um, what we what we plot what I've plotted here. <coughs> Uh, was an attempt to um, answer the question of what the you know what the scale dependence is of this crosswind velocity, and theoretical uh, considerations had led first to the idea that it would be u Stokes times u star squared, and then to make it dimensionally correct, that would be to the one third power, and then but then uh, people like Jim Williams who were doing LES. Um, felt that it was a more appropriate scale to, do, to just have u, u Stokes over U star as a, as a turbulent parameter. Um, so, so to see whether we have, uh, have this U Stokes U star squared to the one third, I scaled both of the, uh, both the crosswind velocity and, and the Stokes drift by U star to see what the residual was. And it's a pretty tight fit, actually. So to the extent that the waves are not fully developed and not really directly corresponding to U-star, that, that difference is picked up by the crosswind velocity scale of the Langer circulation. 
uh, indicating that it's prep, it prefers the Stokes drift as a, as a velocity scale. And with a slope of one, uh, there's no, no call to put U star in there at all. Um, so, so this is a little out of order, but I thought I would show uh, this little graphic about just showing what the Stokes drift is. If you measure the velocity at a fixed uh, depth, it just and, and integrate that orbital motion, you would just get this black circle going and, and around and around. But if you follow the velocity at the actual displaced location, then you get the uh, the looping red circles, which shows you the Stokes drift of an actual particle floating in the water, and you can see it drifts faster near the surface and slows down as you go deeper. So that can, that has an, actually the dynamic effect of the uh, uh, accomplishing the vortex force, the bending vertical vortex lines over. But there is no vorticity in the Stokes drift, so there's no corresponding bending of, of, of that non-existent vorticity, which would cancel it out. So more recently, uh, because of getting ready for this experiment, and after some discussions with uh, Tobias Kukulka and, and Ramsey Harcourt about um, various scalings, I thought I'd take another look at um, this relation between uh, the wind and the Stokes drift. Um, so this is, again, just a summary plot of the, of, of the wind event. And, the blue line is the Stokes drift. The uh, black circles are the estimated crosswind um, RMS velocities. And the red line is U star. And the green line is U star squared. So I, I felt it was unsatisfactory to divide both the abscissa and the ordinate by U star because that induces a correlation of which would have a slope of one. So that was actually kind of unsatisfactory. So here's what happens if you just straight out plot the VRMS crosswind scale versus Stokes drift. And sure enough, you get a nice fit with a slope of one and uh, not a lot of residual stuff. But then I, then I made the mistake of going on and comparing um, U star to, uh, to VRMS. And now what we see is, uh, <coughs> a, again, a, not quite as tight a fit, but a pretty tight fit. But now the slope is 2. So it's saying VRMS is proportional to U star squared, which is a little puzzling. So then I thought, well, what about Stokes drift versus U star? And again, we see pretty good correlation and again a slope of two. So now we have we have these two instances where we're we're dimensionally uncomfortable with this. We've got a velocity that's proportional to a velocity squared. So it seems like you know this one's this one's okay, we can believe that. That seems to be you know confirming what we thought before. But these two are kind of uh, irritating because and for this to be true, it kind of implies that there's a missing velocity scale and that, and that the velocity scale must remain constant um, over this segment, over the segment this data came from. So, and I don't think it has to be the same velocity scale. In fact, I'm, I'm going to allege it's not the same scale. So I'll, I'll treat these separately. For case two, for for comparing the for comparing the Langer scale to U star squared, um, let's go back and look at this cartoon of uh, Langer circulation. And imagine that this is a piece of paper. You fold it right here, so it's at a right angle. So this is the crosswind cut, and this is the longwind cut. And we have these. These are the big eddies. Um, these are the large eddies in the mixed layer. And so we would expect kind of heuristically that, that the, uh, 
effective eddy viscosity for the mixed layer as a whole would scale with this velocity times the depth, which is the scale of the, of the eddies. So H times VLC for an eddy viscosity. And then that's going to uh, <coughs> that's going to work with this very slight gradient that, that we do see in the mixed layer. Um, generally, it's, it's a pretty weak gradient, and that's why we can get away with just uh, ignoring it and saying it's like a slab, and, uh, and you know use the, the slab model uh, mixed layer. So you can think of this small delta U as much smaller than big delta U, which is the difference across the thermocline, and, and is more directly involved with deepening. So now if we, if we put that in, and, and suppose we have a, a kind of a bulk eddy viscosity that scales like VH, and then the, the wind stress is going to look like that eddy viscosity times the, the bulk um, velocity gradient, then you rearrange these slightly, you get H times the gradient is that small delta U, and so that says that the wind stress looks like like VLC times this delta U. And now if you just turn that around, you can see that this, this small delta U now looks like U star over VLC. And if we go with our observation that this is proportional to U star squared, then this is constant. This is no, by no means a proof. It's only saying it's self-consistent. Um, I don't find it convincing. One reason I'm putting it up here so you guys can show it down. <laughs> Case three is really much harder to come up with, and I was, you know, trying really hard over the past, to, well, I won't say how long, uh, to, to figure out what kind of a constant velocity scale would be appropriate here. One thing I thought of was, you know, um, I heard a talk, I think, by Gamrick or, or Chris Garrett, um, that the rate of uh, working, the total energy input, looked like wind stress times a, uh, a velocity scale that was surprisingly constant. It's about a meter, a meter and a half. But I could find no way dynamically to make that uh, work. So instead, uh, <coughs> I went back to this, what if, you know, what if this is just specific to the data segment that I'm looking at? And what is special about this data segment? Well, if you look at the green line, it looks like, pretty much like a straight line, I would say. I would argue. You're just averaging a bit. So let's suppose we have a linear increase in, in wind stress with time. Well, that has the units of uh, meters squared per second cubed. And G has the units of meters per second squared. So the ratio is a uh, velocity that would be constant. So that would that would lead to uh, that would lead to a Stokes drift for the, for this particular time period that looks like g times tau over d tau dt. That's supposed to be dt. Sorry, sorry for the typo. Um, and this has this actually has kind of an intuitively appealing property that if the wind is rising more slowly, the waves have more time to develop, so they can become larger. So that would mean that this, this pseudo-constant uh, would be larger for a more slowly increasing wind. <coughs> so that's my other lame scaling argument, is that it's, it's probably specific to this data segment. Uh, it depends on, on how fast the wind is growing. You know, or maybe there's something else. Uh, I hope, kind of hope there's something more more dynamically justifiable. Um, but the other thing is, since U Stokes and U star squared look the same, you can't really tell the difference. You can't really say whether it's this is proportional to that, or this is proportional to that, or even proportional to a combination of the two. But just for curiosity, I tried comparing that last one, so if you you plot VRMS versus 
the Langer's, Langer's circulation scale versus this product, u Stokes times u star squared, and never mind that it's divided by some mysterious constant velocity. The slope comes out to a half, and actually the fit is better, even better than the, the fit for against u Stokes alone. So maybe the original uh, perturbation analysis that had this combination was was okay, <coughs> but it was missing this constant velocity that reduces it to a, a square root instead of a one third power. All yeah, just just to remind you, here's what the other one looks like. So you compare these two. It doesn't really look that much better. So, to address the um, question of whether it's this particular time period, um, I have a couple other wind events available from an earlier data set from the, the 1990 SWAP experiment. And uh, if you plot, plot these on the same, well, okay, I haven't redone this analysis yet, but I did do already this um, normalized comparison. And the, the blue stuff is from <clears throat> the MBL like one experiment. And then these two are from SWAP. And uh, they were, uh, there were a couple of different, uh, this one was uh, a weaker wind event. You can see it doesn't get up as high uh, in the second one. And also the wind was, was turning slowly. As it as it rose up, so the, probably is why there's a lot more scattering. <coughs> then the red one was a, a really <coughs> dramatic wind turn on event, where the wind went from uh, six or seven meters per second up to 13 meters per second in roughly 30 seconds. Uh, I was actually sitting in the galley at, at, uh, on a flip at the time, and I thought somebody had turned on the exhaust fan. That's what it sounded like. <laughs> but the, the curious thing is, uh, these all uh, are still pretty much within the scatter of this slope of one, uh, just like MBL had. So even though, even though the uh, rate of change of wind stress was quite different, and even different in nature in terms of rotating, uh, we still get this, this slope of one, this idea that the uh, Langer cell scale with the Stokes drift um, preferentially. And, uh, I promised this would be a short talk, so uh, <laughs> this is pretty much the uh, where I am on it. I couldn't get any further um, with this kind of hand waving. Um, so all I can say is it look it does look like the Langer um, velocity scale goes with U Stokes. Um, but it also looks like everything scales with U star squared rather than U star. And, and the missing mystery velocity, I think, is the question that I'm leaving here. And uh, so my third conclusion is, Ken, we still need you. <laughs> we need your clarity of thought and thoroughness of analysis. Because this is a mess. Oh, and happy birthday. <laughs>
So this is the wind vector. And it gets up to here, and it's uh, 10 meters a second. So this is just in the early stages. And then the first thing that happens is you see these uh, bait balls swimming around, because as you mix up the, uh, the surface layer, it confuses the, the plankton, and the predators can move in. Do you want to say what these images are? Hmm? Do you want to say what the images are? Right. I sure do. Uh, so on this side, on this side is the acoustic intensity backscatter, um, and on this side is the the velocity in this direction from the Doppler shift of the of the acoustic signal. And the reason it jumps occasionally is because this is actually just every other hour. It's just the even hours, um, so that makes the movie half as long. Um, so as the wind comes up, you see. You see the streaks first, uh, in, and more clearly in the intensity. This is a you know a second order um, quantity, so it's always going to be noisier. But you can pretty well see that as as the wind increases, <coughs> the uh, the stripes get more distinct, and uh, you also um, you you see an indication here that these flashes, which are probably um, exceptional plungers uh, tend to occur preferentially on the on the bright streaks. So the the brighter parts means more bubbles. The more bubbles are usually collected at the convergence of the surface convergence. And so this looks like evidence that breakers are happening at the convergence zones, but um, that might not necessarily be the case because if a breaker happens a little to the side. This is where the bubbles get sucked down far enough for the sonar to see. So that may be the alternate explanation, rather than than saying that the waves <coughs> actually the wave breaking is correlated with the Langmuir cells, which nobody's been able to establish. And I would argue this does not establish either. So by now you, you, we get to the point where we've seen stripes in both, and something. Really interesting happens at the end. Uh, let's see how close are we. I'll skip ahead a little. <laughs> so now the wind's over 10 meters per second, and we're, we're really getting some bright stripes, and they're a little bit larger as the mixed layer has gotten deeper. Um, but towards the end, we, we'll see this. Uh, interesting thing where the stripes get very bright and distinct and then fade away and then they get bright and distinct again. I think that's coming up soon. Uh, you can see it especially on the intensity side. So they get it's very high contrast and then it kind of breaks up. And this is uh, it's sort of uh, 15 minutes from strong to weak, and then 15 minutes from weak to strong again. So it does this in a half hour period, which is quite quite rapid. In fact, it's comparable to the computed overturn time of the Langer cells. So it may be, and, it, and in fact, recently, uh, Steve Thorpe and one of his recent students came up with a, a nice theory that, that that can explain this behavior, which is that the, you think of the, the vortex lines as, as being kind of symmetric about the center, but if they're not, if they're, say, skewed toward the toward one side, then the then the vortex, then itself it packs itself, and it will become strong when it's near the surface, and become weak when it's far away, and it would do that with the overturn time. So it kind of matches this phenomenon. And, and now I really will stop. <laughs>
I'm counting this as the same from the uh, from the four beam sonar because those two match. Uh, they match really well. Then the the alternate um, comparison I did actually was to compare the the, the advection speed, uh, the feature advection speed that you can estimate off of the intensity side with the mean Doppler shift on the Doppler shift side, but I could only compare that one component parallel. Um, let's see if I can get the mouse back here. some reason going, going crazy on this. Any idea what the colors have gone wrong? Okay. <laughs> ah. So this this is that comparison. Yeah. Um, this I is the <laughs> this is the Stokes drift calculated from the wave spectrum, the directional wave spectrum, and I believe and the stars are the the difference between how fast the features move and the mean Doppler. And because the sonar is grazing along um, under the surface waves, it doesn't see up into the crests. So it's kind of roughly a constant depth um, velocity measurement. And so this is really a, a fairly direct um, measure of the Stokes drift in that direction, and I think it's pretty convincing that they match. So it looks like linear wave theory works. But the, the feature speed would be the sum of any mean or Eulerian speed plus the Stokes drift, so they only match if your Eulerian speed is zero. Is that correct? Uh, well, that's why I subtract the Doppler. So this is <coughs> this is the Eulerian velocity, and this is the Lagrange and velocity. So the difference is the Stokes drift. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Just happened to have a slide for that. <laughs> I think Fabrice wanted to say a few words and uh, 